Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasala with Audioholics, and we are doing a live event this Friday evening on May 3rd. Um, I apologize for the problem I had uh, sent you guys the invite to do this live, and I was trying to coordinate it with Google Hangouts, and we had a glitch with YouTube, so I had to recreate. So hopefully the 30 or 40 people that were waiting uh, found their way into this version that we're broadcasting with. And I wanted to delay this a little bit because I wanted to bring one of our new writers and our new YouTubers, Matthew Pose, on board with me because Matthew is really into this stuff. He's really into bass management, room acoustics. He's kind of one of our hard hitters on, on these topics. So I wanted to have his pr perspective to add to this discussion. So Matt, how are you doing, my friend? I'm glad that you're here today. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, I'm really glad to be here. This is exciting. Uh, it's nice to be writing with you now and uh, great to be on this live stream. Awesome. So why don't you give us a little bit of your background so people know where you're coming from? Sure. Well, a lot of people look me up, see what I do for a day job, which is not related to audio at all. I'm uh, best way to put it is a researcher in child development. But uh, my interest and passions for audio have existed for a long time. And I originally had gone to school for a while for electrical and computer engineering. And uh, when I decided to go on to graduate school, I had the opportunity to also take courses in acoustics, acoustical physics, audio engineering. Uh, so I've been into audio since I was a kid. I actually had a home theater in my bedroom when I was like 12, 13 years old. Just put together extra speakers my dad had or things I found at rummage sales. Got myself an inexpensive Dolby ProLogic receiver. Uh, one of the first things I bought that was like a big upgrade was actually a hi-fi stereo uh, VHS player just to be able to get Dolby Surround at the time. Um, since then, I've taken things more professionally, as I said, took courses in graduate school at a graduate level in acoustics and began offering uh, acoustic uh, uh, consulting and advice for folks, opened a small company doing that. I've now been writing for about two, three years, doing audio reviews, technical articles, uh, and I would say acoustic, acoustic measurement is probably one of my biggest passions. It's something I love doing. Studying the, the, the physics behind it is really interesting. And, and for me, the writing pieces that I really like to help explain this stuff in ways that are easier to understand for the average person. I mean, it's physics. You're never going to get around the fact that it is a science. But, you know, a lot of this stuff can be really overwhelming. And I love the idea of being able to take that stuff and try to explain it in down to earth ways so people can apply it to help make their system sound better. Yeah, and guys, for those of you who've been paying attention to our channel on a weekly basis, we just published a review, uh, a video maybe four or five days ago of you teaching people how to use REW acoustic measurement software. So definitely check that out because really when, when we give this advice to you, when we tell you how to set up your bass management or we tell you where to place your speakers or how to set up your EQ, a lot of it still depends on you doing some real room measurements because you can only go so far with rules of thumb, but in reality, proof is in the pudding and proof is what matters is what measures in your listening area. Using a calibrated microphone, properly using an acoustic program like REW, and that's why we're putting more emphasis on educating in that realm and, and Matt's going to be helping us with that as well. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, share my screen because what here's what I've been noticing. This is why I've done probably three or four, at least three videos on base management over the last few years on, on our YouTube channel. We've got tons of articles on it. We even have articles on and videos on multi-sub, but I think I need to do a more core um, video about the 80 Hertz crossover and why that actually is a pretty damn good number. And THX actually did their homework in this realm because I've seen, I've seen over the last few months, I've seen threads pop up on various forums where people are buying new tower speakers. And even on YouTube, I see videos on YouTube where they buy this tower speaker with a couple of six inch drivers and, it, and the frequency response on it's rated down to 40 Hertz. So they set that crossover at 40 Hertz or they set it at 60 Hertz and they're just limiting their total system base response by doing that. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to show you why. I want to give you some um, example here. I'm going to share my screen on the channel here. Hopefully this comes out OK. Um, I want to go over kind of the history of base management and how it's evolved in receivers and how it's gotten a little bit confusing for some, especially since we have the triple crossovers where you can set the crossovers at different frequencies for each channel group. So back in the day, just to show my age, um, I'm talking about the first Atmos, not I'm sorry, the first Dolby Digital DTS receivers. Matt, do you see that screenshot that I'm showing you right now? Yeah, I can see that. 
Okay. So this is like, I think this is an old Denon or an old Yamaha receiver. And you could see that there was no multiple crossover settings. There was just one crossover. 80 hertz is where I have it set for low pass and high pass. And what that was, the low pass was set for 24 dB per octave. The high pass was set for 12 dB per octave. And this was a THX certified receiver. And the logic behind why they chose these slopes was THX was trying to make the most compatible system possible in a regular room. That way, when someone would bring in THX speakers and a THX receiver, it would be, you know, they would have knowns. They would have known variables to setting up a room for home theater. And this would ensure good integration without having to do a lot of legwork. And they made assumptions that their satellite speakers were sealed designs. Sealed designs naturally have a 12 dB per octave roll off. So when you take a 12 dB per octave acoustical roll off, mix it with a 12 dB per octave electrical roll off of the high pass filter, you get the 24 dB per octave on the low pass filter for the sub. And theoretically, you'll have the best integration at the crossover frequency between the satellite speakers and your subwoofer. So that's where the whole crux of the 80 hertz came from and why THX chose that. The other reason why they chose 80 hertz was that was based on research about the limit of where you wanted to set the crossover to not have localization of base waves. In actuality, it's a little bit higher than 80 hertz. I think you could go almost up to about 120 to 150 hertz before you start localizing it. And Matt, you might want to interject some, some of your knowledge here. I think a lot of it depends on the slope of the crossover and how far away you are from the subwoofer. Yeah, actually, there's a, an interesting story there. 80 hertz was set because that was two standard deviations below the point at which localization wasn't noticeable. So when you said it's actually a little bit higher, that's, that's exactly right. It was a little bit higher, but uh, they wanted to set a point where there was no chance anybody could hear it. And uh, so the 80 hertz was chosen. Uh, the, the idea of using the natural high pass of a sealed box with uh, an actual second order high pass filter as well was chosen to try to create two... Uh, fourth order crossovers with the idea that the summation would be really good. In practice, that's actually not true. Um, it works fine. Uh, we've been talking about this before, you and I, that, that a lot of these ends up being just rules or rules of thumb that you can apply because it helps to work. And in, and in practice, it does work fine. But the notion that you need to have uh, symmetric crossovers at fourth order to get good summation in a room uh, kind of doesn't hold a lot of water when you realize all the things that are going on acoustically in the room in the first place. So while there's nothing wrong with that, there's other ways you can actually achieve the same results. Yeah, reality, I, let me just interject for a section. I, for a section, um, in reality, you're talking maybe anechoically that this would work perfectly. Yep, anechoically, and uh, they would have to be essentially in the same, the, the superposition idea, they'd have to be in the same point in, in time and space as well. So given that we typically don't necessarily put our subwoofers, and in fact, with the new way of doing things with subwoofers, using multiple subwoofers throughout the room, they're often nowhere near your main speakers. A lot of that doesn't apply so well anymore. Yeah, and you raise a good point because now that we, we've been preaching multi-sub for years. So now that we have multi-sub and we can put the subs in ideal locations in the room to manipulate the modes in the room so we can have consistent bass from seat to seat, I would argue that the crossover at 80 hertz could actually be tuned a little higher because I don't think you're going to localize. When you have bass coming from multiple sources and you're pressurizing that room equally and you've got a flat response without big bumps or resonances, you might even be able to extend that past 80 hertz, maybe to 100 hertz. It really depends on your situation. But I don't want to go too far into that topic yet. I just wanted to bring that up. I wanted to kind of show you guys some more um, of the bass management stuff that gets people flapped up especially with some of the YouTube videos I've been seeing lately as well. So here's the Yamaha. This is the Yamaha CXA5100 uh, processor. It's the same thing with their Avantage line. You could see here, this is my setup I have in my theater room. I have my speaker groups. I have the front speakers, the center channel, the Atmos channels, all that stuff. Um, it, this processor, along with a lot of the processors on the market now, allow you to change crossover frequencies per channel groups. And it sounds good on paper, but sometimes it's a mixed bag. Years ago, when this first came out, Sirius Logic was the first to do it. It was, I remember, Matt, you probably remember those old outlaw processors that, in, that uh, had the uh, Sirius Logic chipset. Absolutely. Those things were, were kind of a nightmare because when they were doing the summation back into the subwoofer, 
you were getting very uneven response. I measured this, and it, it was funny that you and I talked about this because you did the same thing. But um, initially, when these triple crossovers came out, they were not doing the summation properly into the subwoofer channel. It was a mess. So that's when I came up with the guideline, don't vary your channel groups more than 20 hertz. So if you're setting your speakers at 80 hertz, don't set any other speaker in your channel groups lower than 60 hertz or higher than 100 hertz. Otherwise, you might get this uneven response coming through the subwoofer output. Now, there are companies that are doing it correctly. Luckily, it's gotten a lot better. I've taken Denon and Yamaha stuff apart on, on my audio precision and measured their inputs. I have an HDMI analyzer so I can interject that eight channel signal into the processor, measure the outputs and see what's going on. And they are doing the summations correctly for most part. I'm not saying all the products are. Some of the esoteric stuff out there still might have this problem. But my, my recommendation still holds true in this case. You really shouldn't be choosing speakers that don't have similar dynamic range, with the exception maybe of the high channels for Atmos. And we're not talking about the bouncy house crap. We're talking about the discrete speakers that go in the ceiling. In most cases, you really want to have all your speakers having similar bandwidth, similar dynamic range capability. So really, I mean, Matt, if you, if you, based on your experience, I'd like to hear that as well, what your opinion is on this. I don't think you should be changing your crossovers more than 20, 30 hertz per channel groups. Yeah, Gene, I, I think you're probably right. I mean, for, there's other reasons too. I think that uh, if the uh, high pass ends up being too dramatically different, the speaker's tonal balance can be uh, somewhat changed. You also can start to have issues integrating those other surround speakers in with the subwoofers. So, you know, often when I'm setting up systems for folks and I'm measuring all the different speakers and looking at how they, one of the things I always check is how it integrates with the subwoofer. When you start yeah. to see really dramatic differences in crossover, one of the problems you have is trying to get, for instance, like a full range speaker to integrate with the subs and another speaker that's crossed over at 120 hertz. They don't always integrate all that well. And so if you do keep the crossovers constant, it makes things significantly easier to get good integration. Yeah, it's much easier when you start at a clean slate and you keep things simple. The, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, usually works in everything in life. It, it definitely applies here. You start out simple, and then after you get the basics going, then you could start tweaking. If you know what you're doing and you've got REW and you're making acoustical measurements. So um, the thing about this Yamaha that kind of pertubes me a little bit is somewhere around when Yamaha switched from their RXZ, RX, uh, the, the RXZ line that was built in Japan over to the Avantage, they got rid of the LFE crossover setting. And I didn't notice that probably until a couple, like a year or two ago. And I'm like, what the heck? I, where's the setting for LFE crossover? And people kind of get that confused that they think they think the LFE crossover is the subwoofer crossover when in fact it's not. Now I'm assuming in Yamaha's case, they must default it at 120 Hertz. I want to show you some other examples and then we'll talk more about that. So here's a, um, here's an Integra receiver that I'm using for my bedroom. It's the DRX 4.2, I believe. And you can see I have 80 Hertz set. The, L the low pass filter for the LFE channel is 120 Hertz. Now what I wanted to show you guys, I wrote a little cheat sheet here. The LFE crossover setting is not the same thing as the low pass filter setting for the subwoofer out. I want people to really understand this. When you're talking about a multi-channel signal, remember in the days it was 5.1, now with Atmos, it's 5.1.4. That 0.1 is the subwoofer or it's the LFE channel. It's the low frequency effects that are mixed from the movie into, this, into that channel, which just happens to be the same output that you're using for your subwoofer where your bass management and sending all of your bass from speaker set small into it as well. So there's a summation between your bass managed speakers and the LFE channel all going to that output. So I just wanted to make sure you guys really understand that because I've seen people talking about, oh, I'm setting my, L my uh, LFE to 80 hertz to match the crossovers from my main speakers. Well, that's not really the case. This is a separate discrete channel. And you typically want to keep it at 120 hertz to take full advantage of the LFE content that's mixed in the DVDs and Blu-rays. So let's go back over here to the, we saw the Integra one. I just wanted to show you one more. This is the Marantz SR8012. And again, I'm doing an Atmos system here. Now they also have the LFE setting here as well. It's on a separate page, subwoofer mode. 
So I wanted you guys to understand that. And then the next topic I wanted to talk about, and then Matt, you could elaborate whenever you, you feel like uh, you need to here. Um, I'm seeing people a lot on the forums where they buy bookshelf style speakers like these SVS. I'm using SVS. So I'm not picking on SVS. It's just that SVS is one of those few companies that really give you a good detailed specs on their products. And I just started doing some calculations in my head using their products to figure out, you know, how much output you're getting from the speaker versus their subwoofer. Um, in this case, I see people on the forums that will go and use a speaker like this as an LCR. And then they'll mate it with like two or four giant 18 inch subwoofers. So they're taking a speaker that has maybe 87 dB of efficiency, which is the prime bookshelf, 87 dB, the minus 3 dB point of 48 hertz, right? They're taking it and they're mating with it a subwoofer that puts out over 120 dB of output. So there's kind of a mismatch in dynamic range, especially if they start bandwidth limiting their subwoofer channel because they want to put more bass into their main speaker. So like if you look in the example of the prime tower, which I was showing you before, I've seen people that buy a tower like this, which has a you know two or three six and a half inch drivers, a mid and a tweeter, and they see, oh look, the 3 dB point's 29 hertz. That means I should set my crossover lower. I should set it maybe 10 hertz higher than, than the rating 3 dB point of the speaker because on paper, this speaker will put out 29 hertz solidly. Well, what they're not realizing is this speaker is, might be doing 29 hertz, but that's rated at one meter at one watt or 2.83 volts, assuming it's an eight ohm speaker. So we don't know how much output that this speaker is putting out when you're really cranking it up. There's no way that a triple three, a triple six and a half inch woofers is gonna put out the same kind of output at 60 Hertz as a PB 4000 sub that has a 13 inch driver and a thousand watt amplifier. Matt, you there? Yeah, I'm there. I was just gonna say, Gene, and I, I, I've actually asked quite a few manufacturers if they'll let me take uh, their speakers out to the field with James and measure. James Larson, of course, does a lot of the subwoofer testing for us and he and I do this together. So, I, you know, I ask them all the time, can I take your speakers out to the field and test them with the CEA 2010? But none of them will let me stick a thousand watt amp into the speaker, see what it does. There'll be no voice coils left. You're talking about no. most of these, most of these six and a half inch drivers maybe have a one inch, one and a half inch voice coil. And they have an X max of maybe what a couple, like 0.3 or 0.5 millimeters or something like that. I mean, it's way smaller than you're getting in a dedicated bass driver for a subwoofer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of reasons to set the crossover up a little bit higher. So one of them is, as you mentioned, the speakers themselves are dynamically limited. The amplifier power out of the receiver, as we talked about earlier, is at best 100 watts in many yeah. cases. Some of them are putting up maybe 120, which is not even a full decibel louder. And so you've got this, this receiver that really doesn't have the power to power it. The speaker can't actually handle that much more power anyway. And you're trying to put a lot of bass through it. Whereas the subwoofer itself has a lot of X max, the subwoofer has better ability to actually uh, uh, output up to, you know, 100, 120 hertz fine. And uh, the other reason actually is what we were talking earlier about multiple subwoofers. When you can place a subwoofer optimally, whether it's one subwoofer, two subwoofers, or four, the more subwoofers, the more low frequency sources basically you have operating in that key crossover region that we're talking about, the smoother the bass tends to be. So first and foremost is even if it's just one subwoofer, if you can get that in the right location, the subwoofer is the better speaker to be producing that 100, 120 hertz. But if you've got multiple subwoofers, you also can smooth that out quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And here's, here's the problem now is when you get people that are, that are lower in the crossover, let's say because they have this SVS prime tower that's rated down to 29 hertz, as soon as when you set the main crossovers and you're running those full range, or even if you're running in base management, you set that crossover to 60 hertz, you're, no, you're taking away the advantage of multi-sub all the way out to the full bandwidth of base. So if your subs are flat up to 80 to, or even 100 hertz, and you're now crippling it by saying these subs should not produce anything more than 60 hertz, or they're going to, they're going to roll off at 24 dB per octave, you're taking away that advantage of the multi-sub modal averaging by having those subs running a full range bandwidth like that. 
So not only are you losing dynamic range in the, in the critical mid bass frequencies, but you're losing the seat to seat consistency that you can have by having the multi subs play higher up in, in, uh, in the bass region. And of course you're losing amplifier power, like you said, because now you're asking that receiver to produce those bass power robbing uh, frequencies. Cause that's really where all the power goes. You suck a lot of power. A lot of these towers, um, if they have multiple drivers parallel uh, connected, you could have some good, you know, three or four ohm impedance dips at the low frequencies. And that's where it just taxes the receiver. And uh, most receivers don't have the largest power supplies, especially in the days of Atmos, when we're stuffing more channels into the same size chassis, you want to try to free up that receiver as best as you can and not try to make it overwork by producing bass into speakers that really aren't designed to produce that kind of bass. Yeah. And, and I'll add to that, a lot of these speakers, even these big towers are ported. And one of the problems with running these speakers too low because they're ported is that my view is this, there's no such thing as a good port. There's just less bad ports. Hmm. So all ports for the most part are, are somewhat noisy. At some point they start to chuff. And when you're watching a movie, there's nothing more distracting than some distortion or port chuffing. And so when you're running these speakers full range and you get that action kicking in and you start to overload the speaker or the woofers are really moving and the port's really active, you start to hear a lot of that noise. If you high pass it a little bit higher, you know, so that you're above that port tuning by a good amount, then you're not really getting anything coming out of the port anymore. And that kind of takes care of that issue. So even though the speaker needs the port, if it's running full range to get the full bass response that the speaker's capable of, if you're using a subwoofer, you don't need that anymore. And you can get rid of basically what isn't a, a great port. A lot of the speakers we review, uh, you know, when I listen to them, what I find is that when you really push them with something that's loud and highly dynamic, those ports aren't as quiet as they should be. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The other thing I wanted to add to this discussion is if you want to run your main speakers large, if you if they do have decent output, if they have within 10 dB of output um, as your powered subs, which is rare, to be honest with you, you're going to have to have some towers that have good multiple 10 inch drivers or 12 inch drivers or something to really get that kind of output. Um, you can run them large and you can still run an 80 hertz crossover by setting the crossover to 80 hertz for the main channels. The thing you have to be careful about is the double bass you're going to get now because now you're going to have the f for two channel audio I'm talking about, you're going to have the full range go into your main speakers and then you're going to have the bass copied over to the subs. That could work if you have the ability to EQ because what you're going to find sometimes is by combining the towers with multiple, su multiple subs in the room is you're going to have overlapping frequencies that can add to a room mode problem that you have or just just too much energy at certain frequencies. That's when you need to go in, whether it's through the main channels or through the subwoofer channel and do some PEQ function to, uh, to kind of squash that down and flatten it out. Yeah, I, and I think people who follow me on the forums know that I often am a promonent, proponent of using large mains. Um, but I think that uh, the, the issue is it's not so simple. So I talk about, you do it, I do it. it, it I think people hear that and they're like, oh, I want to do it too. Well, it actually takes quite a bit of work to be able to make large mains integrate well with subs like that so that they're overlapping so substantially. So you'll often hear on the forums or on YouTube videos, people will say, never run the, I think it's called like LFE plus or LFE plus mains or something like that, where you're getting the double bass. Actually, you can do that. And that's what you're talking about. But the problem you run into is that your mains have to be as dynamically capable as your subwoofers in the range that they're overlapping, or you end up having your mains uh, uh, distort. The other problem is you need enough amplification. Well, for the most part, there's no such thing as a receiver that's that's powerful enough to really do that. So you run separate amplifiers with, I'm not sure how much power, hundreds of watts. I have 300 watts per channel going to mine. There's plenty of power. I have highly efficient speakers. Same with you. That's one of the ways we're able to get away with doing that. The other part is that I do extensive measurements. So just to give you an idea of how extensive and how heroic this can end up being trying to make this work, I just gave a talk at Axpona um, about how to integrate mains and subs. And one of the things I did was I tested both how to do it, where I did a hard uh, crossover. So there was a high pass on the mains and a low pass on the sub. The, the, the speakers actually were the recently reviewed Klipsch, the uh, reference premiere is the RP8000S, and the subwoofer was a Martin Logan, one of the newer 12-inch subs. And uh, I, what I did was I ran them full range, and then I also did the hard crossover. So the hard crossover was easy. Basically, I set everything up. I set the filters where I wanted them, got the levels right, uh, got the distance right to be able to get the time alignment and phase alignment, 
and a little bit of EQ, good to go. Then I went and did the full range version of everything. All of a sudden, it's a mess. So what did I have to do? I ended up having to go in and actually plug the ports in order to get the, uh, because the port output was causing some interference. So I had to plug the ports with some uh, acoustic insulation. I had to play, quite, uh, play around quite a bit with the phase and the time alignment to get that right. Uh, EQ and levels had to be adjusted. I actually had to put a shell filter on the, on the main speakers to get a better integration there, to get the levels right, to match the kind of room curve I was looking for. And so it took a lot of work. It actually took twice as long to set that up. And in the end, it measured a little bit better. I thought it sounded a little bit better, but the work that it took to get there was pretty extreme. And I probably wouldn't recommend the average person doing that. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. I mean, you you always hear people say you never want to mix and match, you know, ported with sealed subs. That that you hear that a lot. The reason why that is is because a ported sub versus a sealed sub has a different high pass. So if you don't get those to align at very low frequencies, you're going to get cancellations. And uh, in my system, I'm running um, very large, very powerful towers. Like you said, they have triple 10 inch drivers. They exceed our extreme baseaholic rating, just each sub alone that are built into those speakers. That's how much output they have. Those are ported, but my main subs, I have two Validon DD15 pluses. Those are sealed. And in order for me to get the best integration down to below tuning of those speakers, which are tuned at 18 Hertz, I had to put a high pass on my Velodynes in order for them to integrate properly. Otherwise I was getting cancellations between the poor tuning of my big speakers and the sealed enclosure, the natural response of the roll off. So by doing that, again, you have to use measurement software. I've got, you know, extension down to 12 Hertz, meaningful extension down to 12 Hertz in my room across all six seats. But it's not for the faint of heart. That's why there are some good guidelines to start with. And in most cases, I would say 90% of installs, I really recommend people base management, base managing their speakers, even if they're towers. Unless they're unless you got a pair of Rebel Salons or you got something that's really high caliber output, or one of the JTR speakers, for example, like you're a big fan of. Um, <clears throat> in most cases, I would say base manage. You know, use 80 hertz as your starting point for crossovers. If you really want to get savvy and you really think you've got some special towers and you want to add that base into the mainstream of the rest of the subs to get, you know, to smooth out your response and you've got the tools for it, you've got EQ and you've got the ability to measure, then you can take it to the next level. But I just want people, you know, I don't want people to get frustrated because it takes time if you're going to do this right. And sometimes, Keeping it simple is the best way. Yeah, absolutely. I think actually trying to keep that in mind, a lot of the rules you hear are really good ways to help keep it simple so that things come together and work. You know, when I do installation and calibration for systems, it's not uncommon for it to take eight to 12 hours. And, uh, and I'm not sitting around wasting time in that eight to 12 hours. It's just a lot of measurements, a lot of setting changes. You know, in some cases you can only predict so much. So you end up having to try something, see how it works and then investigate what didn't work the way you expected it to, adjust that, try again. Uh, when I've done some of the Axpona event setups, uh, I've had that take you know most of a day. Uh, uh, Jeff, you mentioned JTR. So Jeff was texting me this year at Axpona. They were up to like, I think three or four in the morning fine tuning that the night before the event started. And they actually didn't get it totally tuned until uh, two days later. Basically the event was already well into uh, having kicked off and, and they had been showing the room off, but they didn't get everything finalized until around Saturday. So uh, the reality is properly setting up and calibrating a system is a lot of work. And so these rules of thumb that we've been talking about, like you mentioned, using proper uh, base management really makes it easier to get everything integrated properly. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, um, I've seen some questions on here. I was just kind of while you were talking, I was looking at some of the questions that are popping up. One of them that kind of caught me was someone said, um, if the room auto correction system sets the subwoofer distance different than the physical different distance, you know, which one's correct. And that's, that really depends on a couple of factors because we're dealing with some, some um, processor delay now. When you've got subs that have a lot of DSP pro, uh, power in them to make sure that they don't overload themselves or to even EQ them to a flat response, you will be adding physical delay to that subwoofer. 
So that's why some of the room EQ systems, if your subwoofer is 12 feet away, but it's identifying it as 15 feet away, then you've got three or four milliseconds of delay built into the process. So the, the auto EQ is probably correct, but most auto EQ systems don't do the greatest job of auto calibrating multi-sub. So you're still going to have to go in and hopefully you have multiple subwoofer outputs with independent delay and independent channel trims. So you can really time align the subs because if you don't have symmetry uh, placement of your subs relative to where you're sitting, then you're going to have to compensate for the time. You know, you got to compensate for it with time delay. And I didn't want to really get off into this because it's kind of an advanced topic and we've covered this before but there are solutions for that if you're if your receiver only has a single sub out or it's got parallel sub outs which is basically the same thing they just use an op amp to buffer two outputs um, but they don't have independent time delay you could get a little dot a little box from mini dsp that'll take one or two subwoofer inputs and bring it out to four independent outputs then you could do your parametric eq you could do your time alignment you could do your level adjustments so guys, the sky is the limit. I mean, we're, we're in the era now where DSP is so powerful and there's really no excuse to have bad bass in your home theater anymore. If you follow some guidelines and you do some elbow work and you're willing to do some measurements or hire someone that, that knows acoustics, that understands how to integrate subs with your speakers. Yeah, I saw that question when it came up, and it was really uh, funny because you and I, of course, just had a conversation recently where we were talking about how substantial some of the delay has gotten in some of the DSP that's being used in subwoofers. And you're right, it's an advanced topic, but I think it's important for people to know that um, in many cases, the physical distance measurement that you would take using a, a tape measure will not be correct, and that the system itself is able to detect more correctly, the acoustic delay. But what I found is that certain systems, and this came up again in that Expona talk when I did my case study, uh, and in my case, I was using a Yamaha with YPAO, uh, inaccurately measured it. So a physical measure, measure was incorrect. That would have been about eight feet. The measurement that the YPA, uh, YPAO came up with was incorrect. That came up with, I think it was 12 feet. Uh, after fully accounting for the delay that the DSP was introducing, it was actually 21 feet. And so um, it, it's a, it can be tricky. And I would say your best bet, if you don't know what you're doing, is stick with what the auto setup comes up with, because it's probably closer to what you'll do. But one of the nice things about measurements is that um, you can, in fact, uh, measure what the proper delay is and go back and set it up. And uh, in the old days, the way people typically did that is they would look at the impulse response and they would try to compare it. And that's really tricky. It's hard to do that. Yeah, that so, is. Yeah. So I've actually come up with a much simpler technique. And it was what I presented out at Exponent. It relies on using wavelets, which sounds really confusing. But the nice thing is it's just a picture. You're basically looking at a line on a picture and that gives you the time delay. And uh, so that's one of my tricks that, you know, I probably can share with everybody a little bit more how to do that. But it makes it so you can use Room EQ Wizard. Uh, it's a built-in feature. The measurement itself is the same straightforward measurement you would normally take. You just take a full range measurement of your speakers and subs together, and it'll actually show you on this graph how much extra time delay you have that you need to compensate for. Well, you put that in the REW video last week, didn't you? Uh, I, I probably did, yes. I think there's some discussion about that, yes. Yeah, yeah. We probably, we probably will cover that topic again. I wanted to do uh, put out another question here that from Ted, Ted Mansa, Mansana. Um, he's asking, limit the room correction, EQ to room transition frequency, or 2X. You know, um, there's two camps in that. There's one camp, like the guys from Harmon, for example, they don't believe in doing room correction beyond the room transition frequency. And for those that don't know what the room transition frequency is, basically in small room acoustics like you're dealing with in your home theater or, you know, 20 by 30 rooms, something like that. I'm not talking about like a stadium, but like a normal home theater in a house, the frequency of the room transition is where the bass is dominated by the room itself. Whereas above that frequency is the speaker kind of dictates what's going on. And the theory is you don't want to EQ above that frequency because it's kind of hard to differentiate what's going on between the speaker versus the reflections in the room. So there's two schools of thought on that. Um, I'm more leaning towards don't EQ above the room transition frequency. Um, some people really just like to use room EQ as a tone control. 
I've, I've tried both and I've got mixed results with both, but overall in general, like I used Anthem Arc recently and uh, I think that defaults to five kilohertz. I got better results when I EQ'd that to 500 hertz and I limited it to 500 hertz correction. Odyssey is kind of a mixed bag. It really depends on, um, you know, your room acoustics and your speaker positioning. Odyssey used to be pretty harsh when I would do it. Like it sounded very synthetic. But now that they have the editor app, you can kind of limit the range of correction. Um, if you go full bandwidth, you could say, hey, don't boost more than 3 dB. Because I don't like when you see somebody's room correction systems boosting 9 or 10 dB. You can get into areas where you're... Um, you're causing more problems than you're solving, especially if it's doing high Q correction and it's starting to create its own resonances. I've heard room correction systems actually introduce resonances that weren't there before, you know, you turned it on. So Matt, maybe you could uh, shed some light on this as well, based on your experience. Yeah. I, I might play a little bit of a devil's advocate on this one. Um, I definitely wouldn't advocate for these types of corrections to go out to five kilohertz or, or beyond, unless they're very, very sophisticated in nature. But, um, you know, most rooms, the, the actual Schroeder frequency is around 100, 150, maybe 200 hertz. And uh, I actually think that you can go into the transition zone, which is a period after the Schroeder frequency, but before things become truly stochastic, it's called. Just it's the point at which you totally can't tell the difference in modes. You can't separate them out. Yeah. There's this, this kind of overlap zone. And I would say 500 hertz is probably the limit there where it's okay things get pretty messy in that range and a little bit of eq not a lot but a little bit of eq can sometimes help make it sound a little bit more natural um, and i also find sometimes if you only eq below let's say 100 hertz you get this nice smooth bass response and then things get crazy and so you can also improve the transition a little bit if you do that you know and, well, and oh go ahead sorry oh i'm sorry the other thing i want to bring up is here's another problem with room eqing at high frequencies when you're, room, when you're doing room EQ at low frequencies and you have multi-sub, so the multi-sub is allowing you to have seat to seat consistency, it's allowing that microphone to measure consistently from each seat. When it does its correction, it's going to work across a wide listening area. But when you're dealing with high frequency correction from a single source, let's say it's your left front tower, well, the mic positions vary so much depending on where you're sitting the frequency response output is going to be such a big difference that even with the best statistical analysis or if it tries to do a best fits curve, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to make every seat better. So it's really, you're still, when you're doing high frequency room correction or full bandwidth room correction, it's over a very small listening window. And if you notice, um, back in the day when Odyssey first came out, and I'm not trying to pick on them, but I have a lot of experience with Odyssey because of Denon. Uh, they would they basically tell you, you know, put the put the microphone all over the room, put it on all your seats. We have 32 mic positions you can measure, you know, put it near your fish tank if you want, that kind of crap. The problem with that, as I said, is the positional differences are so great that EQing becomes kind of uh, a fruitless, you know, a nebulous goal. So lately, if you look at what Odyssey is doing now in their setup guides, when it's in the Marantz or Denon product, they tell you do not place the microphone more than a distance of two to three foot radius from the primary seat. And finally, they have some sanity in their recommendations. So you have a very, a very narrow listening window where the EQ can be moderately effective for full bandwidth. Yeah, those are good points. I, I find that whether you're doing this manually in your optimization or you're doing an auto correction system, placing the microphone near boundaries can be especially bad. Uh, you know, if you sit in a boundary position, like your chair is up against a wall, uh, you don't really have a choice and you do want to optimize for that. But if your primary listening position is actually a, a more ideal place where you're out in the room and you happen to have some uh, cheap seats or mother-in-law seats, I think as you call it, that are up near the wall and you take measurements there, one of the problems you get is that the boundary itself tends to, that there's a strong reflection there. And so what happens is that you tend to get a lot more intense anomalies and those anomalies then get compensated for when it's trying to come up with, a, as you put like a best fit curve. So what it's trying to do is look at all the different measurements and come up with a correction curve that has the, the minimum of variance basically across them. You don't want to introduce more problems by, by doing this. And, and the algorithm is designed to do that. Even Odyssey uh, really has, it's, a, it's an FIR based uh, correction system. It uses actually a relatively sophisticated algorithm. But the problem is what it's trying to fix 
is actually not really that fixable through mm. that technique. And so the closer the mic ends up getting to places like these boundaries, the more bad information it gets to work with, and the algorithm makes bad decisions, ultimately making the sound worse where you spend most of your time listening. So it's, it's important that if you're going to use those systems, you do it right. The other thing I just want to mention is that, and it's one of the reasons why I, I kind of bag on uh, auto EQ quite a bit. It's also why people like Floyd Tool were so against them. As much as, as um, I don't see how I can say this nicely, there's a lot of bad speakers in the world, that's the best yeah. way to put it. And one of the things that I would say makes a speaker bad is when the response of that speaker off axis, the polar response as you get off of the standard listening axis, um, starts to change dramatically from the on axis response. It, what it means is that when that speaker is in a room, the reflections don't have the same response as the direct sound. Now, in and of itself, that's not ideal, but it becomes especially problematic for auto EQ because they're relying on an omnidirectional microphone that's picking up all of that information equally. It actually can't tell the difference that well between the direct sound from the speaker and its response shape and those reflections. And so it tries to correct for that. But your ear actually has the ability to filter out a lot of those reflections. So the EQ will actually compensate for something your ear isn't hearing, thus introducing an error. And so you might say, oh, I have great speakers. They're, they're really good. They're a high-end model. They're well-reviewed. They don't do this. But the reality is we've measured a lot of speakers at Audioholics. A stereophile is another one that John Atkinson measures speakers all the time. And if you go through those measurements, what you'll find is there actually are quite a few speakers that have a fairly poor off-axis response. And what that means is a lot of auto EQs end up having a bad, basically a bad speaker to work with. And you can't correct that. Uh, EQ cannot fix that kind of problem. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, I've seen I've seen auto EQ systems, you know, the results of them vary a lot depending on not only room acoustics, but on the quality of the speaker. So another thing I wanted to bring up since you talked about boundary problems, uh, people, when they run auto EQ, um, and they look at the crossover settings that, let's say, Odyssey gives you or, you know, Arc or whatever. Uh, many times I see like a surround channel will be set as large or it'll set it at 40 hertz crossover instead of 80 hertz. What these auto EQ systems are not compensating for is the fact that most people have their surround speakers. I know I do, and I saw in your room you do as well. We have them mounted on a wall. And when you place a speaker against the surface like that, you get a lot of boundary gain in those in that in those uh, frequencies. So that's causing um, Odyssey or whatever room correction your system you're using to think that that speaker is larger than it is, or it, it has more bass capability than it is. These room correction systems are not accounting for dynamic abilities of speakers. Yeah, it's a really good point, and, and it's a common issue. When you place a speaker against a wall, you get a lot of boundary reinforcement, and it increases bass output. While that does technically mean that the speaker has more bass, you know, you can see in my room, and I have a very high output theater, but actually on the way back wall there, there's some really tiny surround speakers, and they've got little four-inch woofers. Now, what you can't see, because I designed these myself, is that there's also four-inch drivers on either side, so there's three four-inch drivers on each one. And the ones on the sides are actually low pass to work to help uh, address the, the boundary issue. Because the other problem is when speakers are on walls, the sound from the speaker hits the wall and then comes back and causes interference. So mine are set up to address that. It increases output. But the reality is they don't really have that much more output than they would have. And so if you allow it to cross over at 40 hertz, besides the problems we mentioned earlier, which it can cause integration problems, you also risk overloading the speaker quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So there's another question here. Um, someone did in a super chat, JT. He's, I think it's a question. It says, Klipsch THX Ultra 2 with Atmos add-ons or typical 5.2.4. I guess you're asking whether you should use the modules or use discrete speakers. Um, if you've got a nice system like that, the THX Ultra 2 system from Klipsch is actually a really good speaker system. Why would you limit your entire system now to bouncing sound off of the ceiling? Uh, in an unpredictable manner because you don't you know, I don't know what your ceiling is. I don't know if it's flat I don't know how tall your ceiling is the other problem with the bouncy house um, Atmos modules is when they do their bounce it works in a very narrow uh, Listening window, so I've, I've seen people do demos online where hey sit here and you'll hear the height effect Yeah, it sounds great in that row But go in another row and all of a sudden it evaporates because you're dealing with trying to bounce sound and you know hitting the right angles by doing the bounce as opposed to getting the direct sound from the speaker pointed at you 
you're really limiting the amount of coverage you're getting and also you're limiting the bandwidth because now your that sound is scattering it's not just it's not acting like a, a laser like you see the you see the uh, diagrams that Dolby put on their website where the sound goes perfectly up to the ceiling and then 90 degrees down, it hits you in the area. It doesn't work like that. There's always some sound that scatters all around you. And Matt, I don't know if you play with the Atmos modules. And I hate to keep bringing this up, but people keep asking. But my experience, the reason why I'm so against the Atmos modules, two reasons why, is number one is I couldn't stand the claims that Dolby was making when they first came out saying, oh my God, this is the greatest breakthrough in 20 years. It's better than discrete speakers. Notice how they're not making those claims anymore because we've been drilling them for like five years. Those claims are gone. I can't even find it on their website. That was that was all over their website, all over all over ABS forum with the sponsored posts. All that stuff's gone now. So it's kind of like quietly went away. But the second reason why I'm not a big fan of these Atmos modules is the fact that when you put a speaker on top of another speaker, if you're listening to music, you're gonna really focus on hearing that sound kind of coming out all around you because unless you have a perfect way of, of controlling that dispersion and not having that sound escape around the actual host speaker, it's gonna bleed over. And I've heard this because I've done a lot of music listening. I listen to a lot of DVD audio, you know, the Stephen Wilson mixes and stuff like that. And when I put those Atmos modules on it, it blurred the main speakers. And I've had people come in and listen, I'm like, I had them sit down to do demos. People that don't even know home theater, and as soon as when I put those Atmos modules on, they're like, something doesn't sound right. Like, I don't hear the focus anymore out of, out of the front sound stage or the front speakers. So I don't know. I didn't want to get off too much on this topic, but since it was asked, I figured, why not? Matt, if you've got any insights to add to this based on your experience, I, I'd like to hear it as well. Yeah, sure, Gene. I, I'll say uh, it looks like the, the gentleman who's been asking about this said something within ceilings, not modules, but I'm not totally sure what he's asking. So I'll just say if you could re-ask your question again, it might help us to understand what you're trying to ask. But but in terms of the, the bouncy out speakers, I actually, that's a funny term. I had never heard that before. And you had said that to me in an email once. And I actually had to ask a friend. I said, what's bouncy out speakers? And they said, you know, when they point at the ceiling and it bounces off. And I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it is too bad that those were presented as uh, as good as or better than discrete in ceiling speakers because there's no denying that that's a compromise. So yeah. my my view on that, and I've used them before. Uh, I've set them up for people. I've used them in my own system. I had them sent to me once, and I tried them out. Is that it's it can be better than nothing for that Atmos effect only sometimes when they work right, but it's definitely nowhere near as good as actual in ceiling Atmos speakers. Those are significantly better. And in terms of the, the bouncy house speaker working well, it's, uh, as you mentioned, there's very specific circumstances for it to work well, work well being relative. I still am going to say it's never as good as discrete speakers in the ceiling. But, you know, it, it, I've, I've heard it where it provided a fairly believable Atmos experience. Now, the time that it was most believable was actually uh, Mark Seaton had him set up at uh, uh, Axpona and he didn't obviously were not allowed to drill holes in the walls. Right. X bonus. So what he did was now these were like probably 25 foot high ceilings and he was aiming a coaxial speaker he had just made up at the ceiling in an angle, processing it with I think it was like either a data sat or a storm audio, very high end processor, lots of EQ. And he was processing it with that. And it was a pretty believable Atmos uh, presentation you know, under those conditions, but they were a really good speaker. <laughs> they were placed way overhead. I mean, they were actually put up on trusses. You just hit the nail on the head, my friend. If you really want those Atmos modules to work, you don't want to place them right on top of their parent speaker. You want to place them above ear level because otherwise they become more localized, especially if you've got those Atmos modules too close to a listening area, like for the back height channels. Man, I as soon as when I turned those things on, I was like, I could tell there's a speaker right here. I could tell it's coming from that speaker. And that's because it's at, if it's at ear level, if you have your side channels at ear level and you put an Atmos module on top of it, you're not controlling that sound 100%. And it, it's going to leak over and you're going to be able to, to localize it if you're a few feet away from that speaker. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Now, I'll just mention it looks like the uh, question's been asked again. And the question this time appears to be saying, would you go with the THX clip setup? or spend, uh, um, let's see, set up or spend the same on a typical 5.2.4, 7.2.4. So I, I'll say a couple things on this quick and then I'll let you uh, weigh in, Gene. A, um, I'm not a huge fan of the THX certification. Um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean there's anything implicitly wrong with it. I actually think it's a great idea. 
I just think that there are lots of good speakers out there that aren't THX rated. I think that the THX rating system was a lot more of a black box than I would have liked, which made it hard to tell what exactly you were getting with that rating. And so I would just say I wouldn't spend extra money just to get a THX certification on a speaker. I think you, but but you do want to get a good speaker. Now, in terms of versus 5.2.4 or 7.2.4, my view is you should put as much money into the best speakers you can get. Better speakers make a bigger difference than more speakers. Oh, yeah. It's quality over quantity. And, and that's that's the thing I always see people going nuts on some of the forums is they just they, there's a new processor that's 9.1.6. I'm like. Well, wait a minute. The format right now, as it is, is limited to 7.1.4. Blu-ray doesn't go beyond 7.1.4. So unless you have a really large theater room and you need multiple speakers for to cover a wider area, you're just matrixing those extra channels anyway. Those are not going to be... We have nothing that's decoding or, or nothing that's encoded and then decoded discreetly in the home beyond 7.1.4 right now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think people go a little bit nuts putting too many speakers into a room and often they 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 get lesser quality. And, and I think one of the things is you'll see these reviews, you know, we do it too. We'll talk about a speaker and we'll say for the money, this is a really good speaker. And I think what happens is this becomes this misperception that, you know, we said for the money, it's a really good speaker. They saw it's a really good speaker. Mm -hmm. And so they settle on that and they just keep buying more because they can afford it. The reality is if you spend more, you get more. And sure, there's limits. I, I saw in your last video, there was some talk about a $80,000 speaker. You know, there's definitely a point where diminishing returns is we've gone way past that, right? Like where the speaker is about as good as it gets. But for most of the people that I work, you know, that I deal with around this, the kinds of speakers that they're getting are still well in the range where spending more gets more. And, you know, going for a seven or a nine channel speaker system, I mean, besides the fact that it's hard to get everything set up and aimed correctly so that it integrates well and the sound has a nice flow around the room, the reality is that money was probably better spent on simply better speakers. Yeah, agreed. I, I, guys, we, we said this before, even when I had Hugo on the channel years ago, start out with your base system, get the first, at least get good, get a good 5.2 setup going, you know, five good speakers, two subwoofers then build your system from there. I like having back channels um, in my setup. I would probably get back channels before I'd get a single pair of high channels because again, I'm more biased towards music listening. And I love um, listening to multi-channel and I love listening to two channel up mixed into uh, 5.1 or 7.1. So I'm just looking over um, the questions here, a lot of them are basically asking what crossover frequency they should set their speakers. I think we can, I can't go to, for over every scenario, but I, I think our, our guidance here as a rule of thumb, the 80 hertz thing is really something you guys should be looking at to start with. And if you want to experiment on your own, you're more than welcome to do so. Just realize in your receiver, uh, in most receivers, whatever you set the crossover for the main channels, whether it's large or small, that dictates where the subwoofer crossover is going to be when you're listening to two-channel music. And if you have multi-channel, multi-subwoofers set up and you, let, and you set that subwoofer crossover too low, you're losing a lot of the benefits that you're trying to get with multi-sub in terms of getting C2C consistency in your bass frequencies. So, Matt, do you have anything else you want to add? Because I think we're probably going to wrap this up. Uh, no, I think this has been a great talk. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. One thing I want to, there's one question that just got me here is, uh, so you can't EQ dipoles. Why are you using dipoles? Don't use dipoles for surround speakers anymore. I think that's been, uh, that should have died when we got discrete audio. There shouldn't be dipoles in your, in your setup anymore. I'm sorry. Especially if you listen to music guys, uh, at least switch to a bipole or if you're doing Atmos, I really recommend monopoles your side and back channels and then do the discrete in ceiling speakers and you'll be really happy with that yeah and, and i'll just add you can eq dipoles there's no reason why you can't sure um it's it, they can be a little trickier to measure in room but in, in the end especially at low frequencies it really doesn't matter a lot of people get hung up on this idea that somehow the the base can be direct directional Outside, yes, you can make directional bass, and that can affect measurement somewhat in a room. Now, because what you're measuring at the microphone is actually the direct sound plus all the reflection. So it doesn't matter if the, if the subwoofer itself had its uh, basically directivity modified in some way. By the time it hit the microphone, it was already mostly reflections. 
Yep. Someone named Sneaky Pete just said, I only have an SPL meter. Well, Sneaky, um, I really recommend you get yourself um, the UMM6 microphone. I'll put a link to our to the Amazon um, the Amazon page we have for that. It's about a ninety or hundred dollar microphone. It's a USB microphone. It comes with a calibration file. You enter it into REW, and you should be good to go to start doing acoustical measurements. I mean, you can do stuff with an SPL meter. You can at least get your levels right. You could check the phase. I mean, it, you could do. You could run uh, the pink noise test of your subs, and you could see if they're in phase or out of phase by by flipping the phase of one of your subs and, and checking the SPL at the listening area and see if it increases or decreases. There's some stuff you could do with an SPL meter, but man, we're in the day and age where it's so cheap and easy to do acoustical measurements. And REW is such an awesome program and it's free. I mean, it, it doesn't cost you anything to use. It's relatively easy to set up and it can really make or break your system if you just spend the time and, and get your calibration right. Yeah, I, I definitely highly anybody that's really into this hobby, I think getting a microphone not only can help you with the, especially the bass setup, getting it optimized, but to be honest, it's fun. I mean, that was one of the things that got me into this early on is I just really enjoyed being able to see essentially the fruits of my labor. Yeah, my ears mattered. And ultimately, if it doesn't sound good, it isn't good. But there's something fun about being able to do this. You learn a lot in the process. You learn about how making all these changes and adjustments affects the uh, actual uh, sound of the system as well as how it measures. Um, and it's, it's really helpful in trying to see if something is better. Sometimes you'll, you'll hear something and you're like, well, it's different. I don't know which is better, but it's clearly different. And the microphone can really allow you to take measurements to help you figure out which is actually better. Yeah. I mean, like I've always said this before, I use a microphone just to tr more as a troubleshooting guide. Um, when I set up um, bass in a, in a room, I want to make sure that my subs aren't canceling each other out. So that's really why I use the microphone. Once I get that smooth integration with all the subs, of course, you got to do your listening too, guys. We're not just about measurements. I don't always follow the best measurement because sometimes you could tweak things here or there. You could add a little bit more bass or you might have to take away a little bit more bass uh, depending on your listening habits. So it really does pay to get the measurements at least good first and then go back and do your listening. Do you have any good guides for REW and mic choice? Um, we just put one out. <laughs> yeah, we just did. Go sneaky print. I'm not going to say your name, actually. <laughs> yeah, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> um, go on our last video. We put it up four or five days ago. I think it's called uh, Guide to Use an REW or something like that. And I put links for using the UM to get the UMM6 microphone. All you need is a UMM6 microphone and an HDMI cable, and you plug the HDMI cable from your laptop into your receiver, and then you're good to go. And I mean, it's that's it. It's a hundred dollar investment, maybe twenty dollars for the HDMI cable. So you're looking at one hundred and twenty bucks. That's all you need. Yeah, the cost is is modest. It's really not that hard. Uh, we we said a lot of people, I think, were complaint not a lot, but there were a number of people who complained about that video not going into the settings very much. That was actually quite intentional. Uh, REW already comes with a lot of the settings preset where you want them. And so if you set it up the way I showed you in that video, it should work the way it needs to to get, get you started taking measurements. What I did was showed you the simplest possible way to get started to do that. And I'll also add, you know, uh, Audioholics has a forum. So if you get started with all this, go over to the forum. You have questions that's not working right. Just post uh, screenshots or MDAT files or any of that, and we'll help you. You know, I, I'm around all the time, so I'm happy to help. In fact, I'll post a link now to our forums in case people don't. I mean, I, I would assume anyone that's watching this channel knows that we have an editorial site and a forum, but you never know. So there's our forum. There's uh, a lot of knowledgeable people on that forum that guys that just eat and live base all day long. And um, if I can't go on there or Matt can't go on there, you'll find people. There's a community of people there. And we're all preaching the same thing, good base. You got to get good base because all the research shows, you know, 35 to 40 percent of the experience of home theater is enjoyment factor is, is getting good base. If you don't have good base, you're, uh, you're really a handicap in your situation. Yeah, I'll actually even add it's, it's not just home theater music, too. I think people sometimes get hung up on this idea that people like you and I are, are too into bass or bass heads, whatever. That's not really true. 
there is actually hard objective research uh, that has been done on this that found that uh, the quality of the bass played a huge role in how you perceive sound quality. And I've actually participated in speaker shootouts as well as uh, research studies trying to, to double blind test which was the best sounding speaker. And one of the things that often threw off both the shootouts and the studies was substantial differences in the quality of bass coming out of the different speakers. And so one of the things we had to do to make the, the studies work was actually add, in many cases, something like a subwoofer or multiple subwoofers and get that set up correctly so that it integrated right with the speakers because otherwise people weren't judging the speaker by its qualities outside of the bass. They were actually judging it solely by the bass. And whatever speaker had the best bass was the one that always sounded the best. Oh yeah, that's that's a that's a really good point. Especially if you're going if you're demoing speakers in a in a busy show floor, like at a Best Buy or something, it's when people A B speakers, the louder speaker or the bassier speaker is always going to win that comparison. So unless you level match and get everything on equal playing field, it's hard to do an objective comparison between two products. So I think we're going to wrap it up, guys. Um, if you have any other questions, you know, feel free to to put them down below, and Matt or myself will go in and answer them. I wanted to tell you guys we do have a Patreon channel, Patreon slash Audioholics. And if you become a member of that, you get some extra perks. I put content there uh, before it goes on here or before it goes on uh, the editorial site. We also have, we'll invite you to our Google Hangouts. Um, I'm just getting used to getting this stuff set up. So just give me some time. I had some operational hiccups today. I apologize for that. But I'm trying to get more savvy with this YouTube stuff. And um, another thing we're going to be doing, because we keep getting asked, what should I buy? You know, what's the best speaker at this price point? What's the best amplifier at this price point? Um, I'm setting up an Amazon store, uh, an affiliate store. Where I'm gonna, we're gonna be putting recommended products in there. I'm gonna be putting my own recommendations. Maybe we'll get Matt to put his. And whatever products that are uh, that we're reviewing, if we find that they reviewed well, we're gonna throw them into the Amazon store, so you guys can go directly there and, and get it. We'll even try to put some systems in there as well. So just try to make things um, easier for you because I know people are always kind of confused what's the best thing to buy. We kind of like to take the scientific approach and we like to measure stuff. We like to make sure that things sound good before we recommend it. That's why I often don't give absolute recommendations when people ask. So anyways, guys, with that said, Matt, it was great having you on here. I'm going to commit you to try to do this maybe a couple of times a month with me because I love having these tech discussions and I'm sure people appreciate that as well. Yeah, thank you. I really, I'm, I'm glad I was able to do this and I'm happy to spend a Friday or Saturday for an hour doing this with you. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, guys, we are wrapping this up. Put your questions and comments down below. Go on our Patreon channel, you know, become a member. You could start asking us what kind of videos you want covered. We'll get mad. We'll get other guests on here as well. And my friends, until next time, keep listening.